Okay, next up, um, we're pleased to have John Ortiz with us, and John has uh, come in all the way from uh, the west coast of North America, from Corvallis, Oregon, to join us today. Uh, he's the Director of Product Stewardship for HP Inc., which, as most of you know, just under a year ago, uh, spun out as one of two units from the old Hewlett Packard Computer Company. And uh, in his role and his, with his organization within HP, uh, John drives the environmental design of computer and printer hardware products, ink and toner supplies, and paper products to basically minimize their impact throughout their life cycle. And he's the uh, HP champion of circular thinking right now within, uh, within the company. So let's hear what HP is up to. Thank you. Thanks. So I. This is actually the first time I've given this presentation, so I probably add a little bit. I had a video clip. Can you guys, can you guys play that? Just to kick it off, and it's only about a minute. Um, so good afternoon, and I'm really happy to follow uh, David, because uh, David, I, you know, if I was going to summarize David's presentation in, in two words, it's, this is hard. Well, that was three words. It's hard, okay? Um, you know, what we're trying to do here is difficult. I wanted to show the video, because our view of the circular economy goes way beyond just recycling, but the event is around plastics. I'm pretty passionate about plastics, maybe almost as much as uh, the Eggman about eggs. Um, He's, he's really excited about eggs. Um, so let me, uh, yeah, let me get going in here. And, and uh, you know, I tried to crunch this to 15 minutes so we could have questions or if there are any. All right, you gotta figure this one, figure out the technology first. It's this one. It's just the arrows, right? All right, somebody's doing it for me, thanks. All right, so here's what I'd like to, like to talk about, current state of the industry. Oh, maybe this is a little delay there. Um, and, you know, I think David s from, from Van and Recycling summed it up really well. This, this is difficult. This is hard stuff. And, and as a result, my opinion is it's not really working right for us. And, and I look at it from a perspective of technical grade plastics uh, that we want to use in our, in our products. We do, we do quite a bit of it, as you saw, uh, you know, in our inkjet cartridges we've done over over three billion uh, cartridge, I think it's like three and a half billion cartridges, and used three billion water bottles, right? Were uh, upcycled from uh, from that industry. But you know, here's you, I'll let you read a couple of the stats here. But um, you know, there was a report coming out of the Nordics a few years ago. Something like 28 percent of the plastic is recovered from their from their Wii streams, right? From their electronics recycling streams. Um, and you know, that's about 18 percent of that Wii is plastic. Uh, had some anecdotal information about Germany. Rec essentially, nearly 90% of the plastics recovered in Germany actually goes uh, to energy recovery. So we, we don't we don't view energy recovery as a very as a very 
pure use of, of recycling or, or circular economy. So maybe there was a question before about turning it into uh, energy. Um, but uh, anyhow, short, short answer to this one is system today is not really working. So I'm, I'm going to come back with, you know, here's what we're doing about it. Um, but first of all, you know, when I look at using recycled content, um, and again, from the circular economy perspective, that's just one aspect, and it's, it's, it's actually the, the least pure aspect, right? The notion of the circular economy is you want to keep products or materials in use as long as possible at their highest state of value. I think, is Joe Isle still here? I hope he'd, I hope he'd agree with me on that one. Um, but, uh, and, and to do that, there's lots of different tools and strategies that we use, product longevity, um, maintenance, maintain, maintainability, service, re, uh, refurbishment, um, uh, and, and there was a discussion earlier today about business models. So we have quite a few X as a service business models. And you know, if I was to go down that path today, I could spend a couple hours just talking about how, how that changes the incentives for design. And, and those incentives actually do, uh, do stimulate sustainable behavior because when you're selling a service, you actually own that product throughout its life cycle. So you're gonna, you're gonna treat it differently. Uh, your customers, you're gonna have a closer connection with your customers and, and you're gonna design as much waste out of, the, out of the use of that service as possible. When we look at plastics recovery, um, it's a, for us, it's about building a supply chain. Um, we're not just spot pricing plastic from a week to week basis. We're building into products and, and those products will ship for, depending on the product, as much as 10 to 15 years. So you can imagine, you know, we don't have teams of people going around spot pricing PET or spot pricing polypropylene. You know, we're, we're in it for the long run with, you know, a select group of suppliers that, uh, that we work with pretty closely to, to work on the quality uh, quality assurance, um, assurance of supply again, as well as cost. Um, so I've yet to come across data that suggests our customers will pay more for recycled content. So that's pretty much a starting point. It has to be better. It has to be, it has to be priced below virgin for, for us to even think about it. And in and, and, and at least 15 years that, since we've been using recycled content, uh, we haven't really had a a case where we've paid more for recycled content. Um, okay, so what we learned, I heard a couple of, a couple of great things. I actually wrote a couple, of, this was my, my crib notes were some notes I took this morning during Chris Grantham's uh, thing. You see the word collaborate up there. Um, you know, engagement, vision, learn by doing. There's just two, two IDEO uh, design thinking principles uh, that I was really excited about. I like to be optimistic as well. but. Um, we don't do this alone, right? We do this w working with industry experts, um, industry doers, right? People that are actually practitioners in this, um, and and they're in it for the long haul. Um, so we have inkjet cartridges that have been shipping for nearly 25 years that have not been obsoleted. So you can imagine that's a pretty long time to be thinking about your your supply chain and and making sure that you run you don't run out. Um, and we've been using we've been using uh, recycled content for nearly nearly ten years in our in our inkjet cartridges. Um, and if you run a line out of plastic, um, you you update your resume. So so I'm usually pretty careful to make sure we screen our, our supply base pretty pretty well. Um, okay, so what I wanted to show you here is we've had a couple of different. You know, ink cartridge projects, and, and I'm going to relate this to a, to a much bigger picture, but, but the notion is the same. So about, about 10 years ago, we began, um, we began a project, it's maybe more like 12 years ago, we began a project to use recycled PET in, our, in that top, that wave one cartridge set. You might recognize some of those if you have an inkjet printer, which I hope you do. Um, and we spent about five years on the development of both the processing capability, uh, the take back system to do it. We have a system that's been actually in place for nearly 25 years called Planet Partners. Um, and we expanded it to inkjet cartridges. Our customers can return them for free. Most countries you can just put, we have a mailer or you could, you could uh, you know, go on the web and request a mailer come to you and put them all in there and it, it comes back to our facility. 
Um, and it took us about five years to, to both figure out, okay, how do we sort and separate these, right? That's, that's kind of one technical challenge. And then the other technical challenge is thinking about a supply chain is, okay, I need to augment these streams because there's leakage. We're not going to get them all back. There's, there's other players that will use them. Uh, there's folks that just throw them in their trash bin or recycle some other way. So as a result, we had to, we had to figure out a, a reliable stream of, of uh, plastic from other sources. Um, so I'll talk about why this is challenging for us. So, and, and of course, if you're trying to make bottles, you have food, you have food contact type concerns. For us, it's ink contact. Um, that, the plastic is in contact with our ink. Um, we've often had a, a, an expression we would use jokingly called don't dink with the ink. Um, it, it would be, it's catastrophic for an inkjet printhead to have the wrong impurities in it, you know, as it's jetting out at, you know, 12,000 kilohertz, sorry, 12 kilohertz, um, at, you know, at, at nine picoliter scale, you know, all day long from your printer. And when, when, when the material leaches impurities into the ink, it can actually create a catastrophic situation for our customers. So that's, that's number one, another resume updating opportunity. Uh, so we don't do that. So we, we spend a lot of time making sure that, that the quality of that material is just right. Now here's some other things. Those cartridges, they need, they need a very high degree of dimensional stability. Um, print quality is an element of how secure is that print head in the plastic housing, in the printer, as it scans across your page. Really important concept. Um, they run on automatic production lines that run about two per second. So there's no... There's really no opportunity for blemishes, um, you know, bubbles, um, you know, uh, de deformities, and that kind of stuff. So it's really intolerant to bad quality. Five-year project. The next project uh, was a cartridge set, and we actually went from the white color to black, which is when it went to recycled content, or polypropylene. And um, there we, again, looking for a an augmenting stream of, of materials went to the garment industry and used uh, clothing hangers. So we're actually upcycling clothing hangers on a regular basis. And it's, you know, you think about your clothing is made in Asia, Southeast Asia. It ships over to Europe, uh, the US, Western countries. And, you know, somebody has, now they have a, they have a waste problem because they have these, these hangers. Um, so we actually deal with, with folks. We're starting some work uh, with direct retailers to, uh, to partner up and, and eliminate a middleman, because middlemen add cost. So we're trying to, trying to uh, do that. Pretty challenging environment right now with, um, you, heard it, you heard it earlier, the commodity prices being at uh, you know, 20 year lows uh, really challenges the costs of getting this stuff back, formulating it, putting it back into cartridges. Um, so we did that successfully. That was about a three year project. So, and so obviously I'm going to show you kind of a progression of the learning curve that we had. Now, back in 20, I'm sorry, in, yeah, 2012, 2013, we joined the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, C100, started really drinking the circular economy Kool-Aid. And, and we were looking at this new cartridge, new cartridge family, uh, with a little bit of a different formula of um, polypropylene different design challenges, so they, they hold quite a bit more ink. It's a little more of an office printer uh, type environment. Subject to drop test, and, and another design principle that we don't, we don't violate is ink on customer. So, so they're, they have to be made pretty airtight, watertight. Um, this project, we actually noticed we were getting a really, we are getting a much, much better return rate than consumer cartridges. So that became pretty exciting. And, and I felt like, you know, we have an opportunity here, as we saw this, we're starting a new project. Let's just, let's just try to introduce take back uh, plastics directly into our production line. So that was, that was the project, that's what we did. We, we affectionately called it R2P2. Um, and, and that's what we're doing today. So those cartridges come back to, we have two facilities worldwide. They're, you know, there's, some, there's some automated separation that goes on. There's actually some innovation that we do on uh, separation. And they're, they're ground and size reduced, and they're fed directly to our production lines. So that's a tr 
fully closed loop system um, compared to the other two where we actually do some upcycling of other, of other streams. That took us less than a year. So we had the whole project scaled up worldwide, about 12 different production lines, three different sites um, in less than a year. Pretty big project. And, and that one actually is, is self-sustaining from a cost perspective because we're only paying for some, cleaning, some general cleaning of the material. So our production lines see that material as almost free. Um, so that, so that's just, this is how I get them motivated to do these kind of projects. Bottom line on this is we couldn't do this without the reverse logistics figured out and, and having a really tight uh, process connection with our customers, free take back, um, and, and without some vision. And like I said, it's five years. You know, we had a supplier engaged for five years working on that, and they just had this vision that they really want to do this with us. Uh, they really wanted to do another one with us on, uh, um, you know, on that next project, and they know it's successful. And again, those projects are those products are still shipping. Okay, so now one of the tenets we heard from Chris this morning was, um, you know, learn by failing. So I'm going to tell you a failure story. Um, earlier this year, we were interested in in um, diversifying our supply chain. You know, because clothing hangers, actually, we actually found at one point, clothing hangers were showing up with uh, brominated fire retardants. So I'm not sure what kind of clothes have to ship on fire retardant plastics, but uh, they showed up in our batches. And so we, we, you know, we started to branch out a little bit more. And we partnered up with a, uh, a, a consortium in the Midwest called the Hospital Plastics Recycling Center, Recyc Recycling Coalition, excuse me, HPRC. And you know, one of the pictures I had seen was this picture of this forklift truck moving these blue wraps. So if you're lucky or only lucky enough to need surgery, um, you're already out cold and, and all the instruments that they're gonna use on you are, are wheeled in under a protective polypropylene fabric uh, clothing, uh, cloth cover. Um, and as you can imagine, medical industry, you know, what I'm thinking, I see this picture is wow. That's a really homogenous looking bale of stuff. Very consistent volumes. Um, we just keep adding hospitals and we'll get more back. Um, medical grade, really high degree of purity. Um, so it was attractive from a supply chain perspective. And you know, we went into a, we went into a project to, to qualify it. A little bit different, you know, there's different material properties with the cloth-based polypropylene. We actually found that we had difficulty processing it, right? So t traditional plastics, you, you could probably tell me this, right? They're, they're ground and shredded. Um, you, know, you need different equipment to handle fabric type stuff. And as a result, we had, had to add a, another party in the mix. And, uh, and the end result was it drove the cost up so it wasn't, it wasn't attractive to us anymore. So we had, a, we had a bail on this project, but I'm, I'm showing this here because there might be somebody out there that says, hey, I've got a stream of polypropylene, PET, ABS, or hips that I'm really interested in, you know, trying to get into your products, and now you know what I'm what I'm looking for, right? But if you can make it look like that consistently for years um, and and save us some money, um, then it's going to be something we're pretty interested in. We we have another project going on. So I've been talking pretty mostly around uh, inkjet cartridges. Um, we use a lot of plastic. We have a voracious appetite for for technical grade plastics, and, and you know they span the they span the gamut. But I would say like you know, two biggest items of consumption are hips and ABS. Um, and you know that picture I showed earlier about it not working. When those streams come in like that, they're sorted and separated in lots of different ways. Um, and Fire retardants, like brominated fire retardants or halogenated substances. Uh, I heard antimony was discussed earlier. That's one of that's a component of some uh, of some fire retardants. Those are poisons to the to the system, right? So they they, they impact the, the 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 product. They impact the the strength, the moldability of the plastic. So um, we actually partnered up with a, a major electronics retailer in the in the U.S. and said, you know, we. Like to, we'd like to work on that, that collection process. Um, and we could do a promotional opportunity, offer customers you know, some discount on the new printer if they bring theirs in and return it. 
And, and we found it was, it, was, it was a very successful project. It spanned about four months. Um, we got a pretty decent stream of material. And we did design of experiments on different levels of separation and sorting, up to and including you know, a manual disassembly of a, of a printer. So, so our streams here were mostly printers. Um, and you know, like I said, we, we went from throwing the whole thing in a hopper to or shredder to you know, disassembling the case parts, se separating them. We wanted to see what, where, where the, where's the economic crossover. Uh, we actually found we, we found the, we think we found the sweet spot. Um, so now our challenge is we want to develop some other, some other retailers to do this and actually bring this to scale. Uh, so if there's any retailers out there, this would be another, this is another opportunity. So let me just tell you what the, what the, the, the carrots are for somebody running a, um, you know, a product take back type operation. So this is, this is first of all, the, the, the negatives are it's a logistics challenge. Um, a lot of companies don't have the ability to handle, geez, you know, what is this, you're bringing this back, where does it go? Um, I don't have space in my back room, I have to train my, my sales reps. Um, but during this pilot, we actually found uh, there was some foot traffic increase just for the promotion. Um, customers who used the promotion actually were better customers, and I, I define that as they, they, they didn't buy the, the lowest value printer, right? They actually bought something, something some mid-range and up. Uh, which is good, that's good for us, it's good for the retailer. Uh, but I think the foot traffic was, was a pretty exciting thing. We also found it helped, or at least, at least the retailer found that there was, some, there was some benefits in terms of their brand recognition. Um, so like I said, we're using that data to try and enlist more and, and, and do, this, uh, do this considerably. And, and here's where I wanna talk about you know, the notion of trusted partners and collaboration. So we've been working with both Sims and, and Laverne are pretty well known in the in the U.S. and Canada, um, and 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 I think another concept that Chris mentioned this morning was nurture your ecosystem. So so that's that's an approach we have is you know, we want to keep these guys whole because for just as many people as have trusted relationships, there's some that I don't want to work with anymore. Um, so and and yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll kind of move on from there, but. Uh, this is something we're doing. We plan to scale this up. Uh, there's opportunity there, and would like to take advantage of it. And then I'll finish on my my very succinct call to action. Um, Got to have a collaborative mindset. There's no quick wins here in this in this business. Trying to trying to extract the kind of valuable uh, re resin to make products out of is not something you're just gonna flip on overnight. We have, we have pretty long, prolonged qualification periods. Uh, we actually have to build product with it, test the product. Um, color and cosmetics for, for printers is, a, is probably the biggest challenge. Um, for the inkjet cartridges, it's, it's just impurities that might uh, leach into the ink. So having a consistent formulation is pretty important. Um, it required a, a great deal of innovation. So our innovation there was around, um, around the take back. So our Planet Partners program is a, is a, network, of, of a network of retailers that uh, um, you know, do this for us. Um, and and it, we, we, we do quite a bit of you know, payment and, and uh, coverage of some of the costs. Uh, we manage some of the processes for them. Um, I'd like to say there's reasonable money to be made um, the, the folks that I won't work with anymore are the ones that have kind of gone into it saying, yeah, we want to work with you. And then it ended up trying to tack on, you know, 10, 15 cents a pound, which is just, just, just not sustainable. Um, and, you know, I think for OEMs like HP and others, just, there's a much bigger opportunity here than just meeting the eco-label minimums. That's, that's a big driver for us right now. So we have, we have EP as an example, Blue Angel. Uh, they do drive some behavior. They're, they're good. Um, but we're always trying to go, we want to go well, way beyond that. And then, you know, again, I think there's opportunity to partner with OEMs. It's, it can be frustrating at times, but uh, uh, it, it can be worth your while. And I think that concludes my, my slides. So are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Uh, one, one quick question. Yeah. Two. So the, f the feedstock is the challenge. Feedstock's the challenge. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be there every day. Now, I think that's a value to 
to anybody who wants to participate in this business because I think trying to sell recycled plastic on the open market is, is pretty sketchy. You know, there's only so much demand for park benches and, you know, things that you can downcycle to. Our products, we, we ship them a lot. We ship them every year. Um, so. And, how, and are you putting recycled content in the, in the printers themselves? Yes. Yeah. And, and I want to do more. Yeah. Okay. Great. Lunch, uh, not lunch. lunch. Coffee break. Coffee break. I don't understand behind Is it? you and coffee. Well, Thanks Mary Lou. No, we have one more. Mary Lou. Sorry. We have one more. Mary Lou's coming up. With a whole.